Hey, what's good, self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great, and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital, and today we're coming at you with this week in cannabis news from November 15th to the 21st. So before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learned something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos, and there's plenty of content for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself with. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so that you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the industry, identify top companies that you keep seeing pop up, and take advantage whenever you're ready. Now, there was a ton of news this past week, and as we get closer to, I think, some sort of an action, there's just going to be more and more news. So just to bear with you, I have about 20 stories here and another uh, link with about 10. So there's a lot to go through, but I'm going to try and make it quick and tie it all together. But just before we start, I want to highlight that I just want to get three main things out of the way. Is an update on safe? Has anything changed? Is it still a 50-50 chance, yes or no, that we're going to have to wait for? Secondly, an explanation for the price action that we've been seeing. And thirdly, just highlighting that Germany has announced to the world that they intend to legalize. Because I think these these three are the main, you know, bigger picture things that we want to happen. So firstly, we'll start. Brady Cobb, no NDA vote last night in the Senate. Parties could not agree on anything. Go figure. He says the next vote is November 29th at 5.30 p.m. Now remember, SAFE is, or sorry, the NDAA is a must pass with conference process following thereafter where SAFE has its day, aka let's make a deal, keep making noise. And he tweeted this early morning on November 19th, basically just saying that nothing has changed and SAFE is still just a 50-50 chance left up to the conference process and that will be up to the Senate Armed Services Committee and the House Armed Services Committee. Now I just wanted to share because some other MSO investors were saying, hey Brady, you know, is, is November 29th a typo? Because on Senate.gov, it looks like they're convening at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time to continue the NDA debate on the 19th. A few other investors said that as well. And I checked and it said that, but now it's also saying that they're going to reconvene Tuesday, November 3rd. Same thing. So I almost would rather trust Brady based on his consistency with delivering good information and the fact that he's working on the ground with these politicians as opposed to some U.S. government websites. So just wanted to share that, but as of right now, no new news. It's still a 50-50 chance. And then this is worth sharing from Santiago Dunbar. So thank you, Santiago, for making this tweet. Per Brady Cobb Law, the challenge for safe banking will be the Senate Armed Services Committee. Now, we know how many times safe has passed through the House. So chances are House Armed Services Committee is like, yes, we need to put this in. It makes sense. Senate Armed Services Committee is a different story. However, this committee has 26 members, which do not include Cory Booker or Senator Schumer or Chuck Schumer, which is very positive, but also worth noting 21 of which live in states with active rec or medical programs and eight members of the committee are current co-sponsors in SAFE. So just wanted to add that these are good odds. Um, both the chair Jack Reed and the ranking member James Einhoff have shown very strong support for SAFE banking in the past as well. Um, and so it's really going to be up to the Senate Armed Services Committee. And so just wanted to share that this is a podcast you can listen to on Spotify all about the States Reform Act. Will this finally be the end of federal prohibition? And this is obviously an interview with uh, High Rise and with Brady Cobb, just giving the information that he has, the most up-to-date info from being a DC lobbyist. And then I also found this resource called the Defense Primer NDAA process, and we've been through all this, but the last step for us to go through is conference. And so just wanted to highlight a few things here. A conference committee is traditionally used to resolve differences between the houses in the NDAA, Conferees are House and Senate members drawn mainly from the House Armed Services Committee and Senate Armed Services Committee who are expected to resolve disagreements between the House Senate position and provide an agreement in the form of conference. I thought this would be comical to add as therefore considerable effort is put towards completing the NDA conference prior to October 1 each year. Well, it's November 21st and we're way past that. So that is adding to the pressure. And I just wanted to share this insight because a lot of people, I, or I see on Twitter that people seem to think that what Schumer says goes. And I think that's just a simple and lazy way of thinking because the Senate Armed Services Committee is made up of individuals that have their own constituents, their own donors, their own lobbyists, and their own intention of getting reelected. So do you not think that the Senate Armed Services Committee members would have more incentive to work again in their own interests for their own donors, constituents, so that they can get reelected versus doing what Schumer wants? For that reason, I think there is a really good chance of SAFE actually staying in the NDA, especially because when we look at some articles from October 28th, Colorado's largest dispensary chain, 15 burglary attempts in 90 days last year. 90 days, 15 burglary, burglary attempts. Can you imagine that? And then I actually tr started to look for this week on November 18th, cannabis delivery driver robbed at gunpoint Martinez and probably driving cash. And this one's from November 20th, cannabis store employees shoot suspected robbers. Again, if safe passes, none of this even happens. So it's just good policy to pass safe so that you get 25 billion in cash off the streets so that you don't have armed robberies targeting people that work for these cannabis companies all the time. So that is it for the safe update. So thank you for bearing with me there. Now, second on price action, vampires are back. Top US MSO names, the most shorted on the CSE in dollar value and number of trades as of November 15th. Would love to see these shorts get roasted. And I imagine that they will. 
But why are the shorts doing this? Because they know that they don't need to, well, they know that there's going to be no news at least until after November 29th. So I imagine the shorts are comfortable again, and they decided to open these positions back up. So if we go to shortdata.ca, largest short positions, and if we go to the CSE, November 15th, back at it. True Leaf, Green Thumb, Cure Leaf, Cresco. So for any of you thinking, oh, we're, you know, we just saw 30% gains in, in like the span of two days, and now we've dropped all the way back. It's just because the shorts are doing their shorting thing again. So it's not retail selling all their shares saying, oh, these companies put out better numbers than they did three months ago. I'm going to sell. It's just the shorts doing that. So it's just worth knowing if you understand that, then it's easier to not look at the share price and not, you know, get caught up in thinking that, oh no, these prices are going to go to zero because these companies are far too fundamentally solid and they're actually profitable. So that would never happen. And then lastly though, Germany to legalize cannabis in economy boosting bid after Merkel departure. So again, this is really just all we have as of right now. Germany will decriminalize certain sale and consumption rules of the drug in a significant drug policy change for the ruling Germany coalition government. Now, have they legalized? No, but they intend to do that. So this is great. Uh, this is progress. And I just wanted to highlight this because this is likely the domino for the rest of Europe. Now onto the stories uh, from Washington Post. Democratic divide puts congressional action on cannabis in doubt. So well, we're going to scroll down just to the main juice that I wanted to share because we know all this fluff. Now, Republicans are warning that broader legislation simply can't be passed this Senate, and that the narrow bill, their narrower bill could be at risk as well if the GOP retakes the majority of either chamber in next year's midterm elections. Sen. Rand Paul of Kentucky said that safe banking would garner 10 to 15 Republican votes if it came directly to the Senate floor this year. It would pass 100%. Broader legislation, he suggested, would not get any, especially uh, Schumer CAOA. And then so if we scroll down to the bottom here, just again, the main juicy parts, but for now, senators are following Schumer's lead. No senator has filed an amendment to add the banking provisions to the defense bill, even as some wearily admit the legislation is needed. However, the devil is always in the details, because when I read this, the play was never to add an amendment to the Senate version of the NDAA and pass that. No. The play was always to go to conference, therefore it would be out of Booker and Schumer's hands, and then the committees could end up deciding what was best for their constituents, and if safe happens to be the best, let it be the best, because it is. And as long as Senator Schumer and Senator Booker are opposed, it's not going to happen. I think this is just political theatrics said Sen. Jeff Merkley, who has introduced the Safe Banking Act in the Senate and is now exploring whether racial equity provisions could be added to the bill without losing GOP support. Action, Merkley said, is needed in any case. If you like people robbing each other, or if you like money laundering, or if you like organized crime, this current system is great. But if you actually want to protect small businesses, we need to pass this bill, which is so true and why the inaction makes the Dems look so bad. But onto this, I just want to add this from Tom Engel, longtime cannabis legalization opponent, Senator Dianne Feinstein, just co-sponsored the Safe Banking Act to let cannabis businesses access financial services. Now, this would be notable. However, when you consider that uh, California legalized medical in 1996, and this is the first time Dianne Feinstein is representing anything cannabis related ever in her career, that's 25 years late. So, I mean, this is great that there are now 41 senators signed to the bill, including its lead co-sponsor, which is awesome. But just goes to show that it takes way too long for, for politicians to get on board with the real issues if we're not making noise and pressuring them to do so. On to this one, Schumer wants to keep big boys out of cannabis legalization uh, or out of the cannabis industry and say legalization bill is passable. This is false. His bill is not passable. So he's just talking out of his butt there. Now, a few things to highlight. We're taking a page from New York's book and trying to do basically what you did nationally. He told former Democratic Assemblywoman Tremaine Wright, who now chairs the state's cannabis control board, isn't this the sign of a politician and not a businessman? Because clearly New York, they've written a few laws and told a few people their new positions. That's it. They haven't done anything. So again, him, you know, lacking the whole implementation and then testing it to see if it actually works before going nationally. Uh, it's just so funny. He's such a dreamer and so disconnected from reality. What it will do is ensure that Americans in all communities won't be arrested or barred from receiving services from using cannabis where it's legal because the state's making it legal. Well, as of right now, Chuck Schumer, social, social equity entrepreneurs in your state of New York cannot start in this industry because you will not pass safe banking for them. So a few more things just to add from this article. He's made similar remarks in the past, stressing that his reform bill will take specific steps to restrict the ability of large alcohol and tobacco companies to overtake the industry. I think passing safe is the best thing that you can do to prevent these companies from getting in because then you actually actually let entrepreneurs start and grow their own businesses. And as long as those entrepreneurs don't sell their business in the future, and I mean, hey, they should be able to sell their business at some point if it's sustainable and it will make the money if they want to. There should be nothing against that. However, you not passing safe stops that from even happening and does actually give these um, these 
large conglomerate companies a chance to take over. Well, the majority leader also talked about the distribution of tax revenue from cannabis sales under his CAOA Act that he has yet to even file. However, unfortunately, if you want to tax these MSOs at the rate that you want, Schumer, then they'll never be able to keep enough profits to become individual entities. And exactly what you're saying you don't want to happen would happen as they'd be able to swoop in and buy them up easily. So last few things, Schumer said in September, however, that he and his colleagues have an agreement that the body will not take up cannabis banking legislation until more comprehensive legislation moves. Now, this was in September, and this was before Nancy May. So that said, he's open to exploring an alternative way of advancing banking reform if lawmakers are able to incorporate social equity provisions of legalization, such as expungement for prior cannabis convictions, into separate defense policy legislation that the chamber will be taking up soon. Well, why don't you just pressure the president to use his clemency power? Schumer. It doesn't seem like you're doing that. Well, others certainly are, as cannabis industry CEOs call on President Biden to issue pardons. So at least we can see that cannabis industry CEOs are taking action and they want this, while another senator, Elizabeth Warren, pushes Biden to do mass cannabis pardons with a stroke of a pen. But where Schumer's call on, on Biden to, to pardon people, right? Which is absolutely ridiculous. President Joe Biden could boost the economy and promote racial equity with the stroke of a pen by granting clemency to people with federal cannabis convictions, Senator Elizabeth Warren said. While Warren started by saying saying that Biden could help close the black and white wealth gap by canceling student debt himself. And well, I mean, I don't think anyone should cancel student debt because if you take on student debt, how are you going to learn the lesson that taking on debt without understanding how debt works is not a good thing? And she said cannabis was the same kind of issue that he could address with unilateral action, which is 100% true. And there's no better time for Biden to do that than now, especially after delivering this message to the American people. So thank you, Kevin Carrillo, for sharing this clip and Stephen Nelson for asking this question because this timing is impeccable. Well done, sir. We need this type of real reporting out there. So I'm just going to play this clip from Forbes. They are going after the new department. Oh, it's painful. From Purdue University. Oh, wow. Um... I, there's a lot. This is an important question. No, it's not, you spineless coward. Um, I, uh, I, we will get you that um, after the briefing. I can confirm that part of it is staying in a hotel, uh, which my, my daughter did not believe me, but that is accurate. They stay in advance, the turkeys do, in a hotel, but we will get you the details. I think there have been uh, details put out by the... I'm not sure if it's the Turkey Bureau, but um, we will get you all of the details oh after God. the briefing. Is there any humans going to be pardoned by President Biden? There are people who are serving life in prison for marijuana who want him to Water. honor his commitment to release She's separate from prison for pot. Are people going to get pardoned as well by President Biden? I, I will just reiterate that the president is, of course, I have nothing new to update you on, but the president is, of course, uh, will look and to the use of his clemency flowers. He's flowers. talked about uh, his approach or his view on nonviolent drug offenders, but I don't have anything um, to update you on on that today. Oh, but that's not an important question, Jen Psaki. Clearly, she wasn't expecting it, but... If you're an American and you voted for the Democratic Party, you just ought to be embarrassed by how they are showing the American people who want cannabis legalized, 70% is the majority, that they would value the life of two birds above thousands of people that are still stuck in prison for the outdated laws they could fix if they want. So onto the good news that we love to hear. GOP Congresswoman says she used cannabis to treat depression. So thank you, Nancy Mace, for sharing this personal stories and Fox News for actually sharing it because who would have thought Fox News, run by a lot of pharmaceutical donors, would allow a story of a politician who used opioids, found it didn't work, switched to medical cannabis and solved her issue. So just gonna share her story here quickly. Do it. I wish more people in Congress were rational like this. Uh, Congresswoman Mace, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. This is funny. Do you smoke? <laughs> Do I smoke? Still such a taboo question Oh my question goodness. For well, I actually, I have a personal story related to, to cannabis myself. Um, when I was 16, I was raped. I've told this story oh before. But I was given, I was given prescription medication um, that made the feelings I had of depression worse. And I stopped taking those prescription drugs and I turned to cannabis for a brief period of time in my life. And so um, when I talk to veterans, this bill is particularly protective of veterans, Good. Uh, ensuring that they are protected, not discriminated against, yeah, and that the VA um, can utilize cannabis for their PTSD and their protections for PTSD. So when I talk to vets, you know, I feel that pain because I see that pain, it, it hurts because I felt that pain before in my life. And well, veterans. And I imagine this story is very relatable to a lot of Americans, especially because cannabis is what it is. It's a medicine. And the fact that federal laws are still trying to prevent access for American people is insane because if we look at some new studies, perceived efficacy, reduced prescription drug use, and minimal side effects of cannabis in patients with chronic orthopedic pain. It's always been an 
an exit drug. It was just propaganda that said otherwise. His medical cannabis was associated with clinical improvements in pain. Sorry, the results of the study, function and quality of life with reductions in prescription drug use, 73 either ceased or decreased opioid consumption, and 31 discontinued benzodiazepines. Importantly, 52% of patients did not experience intoxication as a side effect of cannabis therapy. Significant clinical benefits of cannabis occurred within three months of initiating cannabis therapy and plateaued the subsequent follow-ups. In conclusions, this work provides a direct relationship between the initiation of cannabis therapy and objectively fewer opioid and benzodiazepine prescriptions because cannabis is an exit drug. Our work also identifies specific subpopulations of patients for whom cannabis may be most efficacious uh, in reducing opioid consumption, and it highlights the importance of both physician involvement and patient self-tiration uh, in symptom management in cannabis. And this is obviously a call to deschedule cannabis so that we can schedule, so that we can actually research this plant more fully. But I would say cannabis was the exit drug for me from alcohol, and it has made my life so much better since I've just made the switch. Well, this one, I just wanted to highlight that was from November 7th, November 12th, so it's fairly new. This one's from November 17th. Exercise increases the body's own cannabis-like substance, which reduces chronic inflammation. Summary, exercise increases the body's own cannabis-like substances, which in turn helps reduce inflammation and could potentially help treat certain conditions such as arthritis, cancer, and heart disease. And these are some of the largest killers, cancer and heart disease. So yes, exercise is very important for a long life if you want it. So you can read more information on the study down here if you want. And I think there's no better time because as this news is out there, annual overdoses, deaths from THC, nothing. As weed continues at zero ever, but it's still a Schedule 1 substance. While we have the new news reported by Washington Post, U.S. drug overdoses, deaths this past year, and apparently there was an uptick from Afghanistan, causing it to surpass 100,000 for the first time ever. And so that, and who's to blame for this? None other than the pharmaceutical companies and the politicians that make up your Congress and House of Representatives. On to part two. So we've got a nice clip from Fox News again. They're talking cannabis, so i got to share what they're saying. Um, and this, so this one is a clip uh, of Todd Harrison on Fox. Just want to share this one. Informative as well for any investors. Right, so a couple years ago, cannabis stocks grabbed the attention of everybody, and in many ways it kicked off this new investor revolution. But execution didn't live up to hype and legal changes needed to really move the needle in the big way. It didn't happen. And those stocks came off their highs, pun intended. Uh, joining me now is CB1 Capital Management's Todd Harrison. Todd, you know, for a long time, the, the word was Republicans would be the roadblock on the path to decriminalization and other things that had to happen on the national level. But that's changing. I want you to take a listen to what GOP Congresswoman Nancy Mace of South Carolina had to say. Nancy, not Nancy. It provides a federal framework to have a very low federal excise tax on these things mm -hmm. and uh, provides a regulatory framework and recognizes every state's different, doesn't force one thing or another. There's criminal justice reform in here. There's protections for veterans um, and protections for small businesses and farmers. And this really is and truly will be a bipartisan, a bipartisan effort. If we're going to do this as we should, it's past time that we do it. So right now it looks like a, the bigger obstacles are Democrats like Schumer and Booker. Your thoughts? Who would have thought? Well, 70% of, of the country, according to Gallup, is in favor of legalization. It's terrific that Representative Nancy Mace would bring this forward, uh, predicated on states' rights with criminal justice reform in there, and the GOP playing ball on U.S. cannabis. And it brings the, the issue to the and the GOP playing ball on U.S. cannabis into the midterms. That's good for U.S. cannabis. It brings the, the issue to the table. Ironically, as you alluded to right now, safe banking uh, is in the House version of the NDA and it's sitting in the Senate. And, and we've already had 24 governors who have come across, including the governors from New York and New Jersey, who have asked that this passes. Uh, Senator Schumer and Booker both maintain that it will not be in the Senate version, uh, which is interesting because New York and New Jersey are illegal and without functional banking, those social justice programs are DOA. Yeah. But we do think safe banking has a shot. We think it'll come out of the conference pr uh, process perhaps, and if it comes out of the conference process after Thanksgiving, we think it's going to be signed into law as it should. That would be phenomenal. Now, Wall Street still not on board either. You know, uh, just a week ago, I told my wife to buy Tilray about a week ago at 10 bucks. Getting slammed today. Someone gave, gave it a sell rating. <laughs> so, so what's up with Wall Street? They gave up on it, which, which makes me excited. Uh, and by the way, what are some of the individual stocks that maybe we should be looking at? MSOs. Yeah, well, Tilray is a Canadian company, and, and that's why they're listed on the NASDAQ. Uh, that they're, they're within their legal jurisdiction. The interesting part, I think we talked about this last time, is that the U.S. cannabis companies are re relegated to junior exchanges. The only New York Stock Exchange listed ETF that has exposure to U.S. cannabis is MSOS. That's where we advise them. We have a position in MSOS. 
they have the positions like the Veranos, the Green Thumbs, the Cura Leaves, the Terrasens, the True Leaves. Those are the companies that we think you want to own going right. into next year. We think U.S. cannabis is where you want to be, not not necessarily Canadian cannabis. All right. Well, you've made that point before. I'm glad you're sticking with this in a lot of... And again, this is for long-term investors, not day traders. Obviously, the day traders love the Canadian LPs because there's more liquidity. But that reiterates what I was saying before with the conference process and the latest information that we do have. So I wanted to share that clip onto some MSO news. Uh, Verano announces release of last RTO shared lockup. So they've announced the pending release of the last contractual trading restrictions remaining of 35% of the shares. It's issued in its reverse takeover transaction completed on February 11, 2021. And I think this is from when they IPO'd at least. But for my understanding all this means is that there is more dilution to come from Verano. Uh, all shares issued in the RTO were subject to 400 day lockup trading lockup to be released in periodic installments with 15% scheduled for release December 18, 2021 and the remaining 20% balance scheduled for release uh, March 18, 2022. So this will be the last day uh, and the last lockup after March 18, 2022. There will be no more share dilution uh, from for Verano shareholders from my understanding. So I wanted to share that. On to this news out of Florida, the Office of Medical Cannabis Use looking at November 19th, so this past week of November 15th to the 19th. And only one MSO opened a new location with Cureleaf opening in Spring Hill. But if we take a look at their qualified patient counts, last week we saw the growth slow to uh, only a 1,000 new patients, which was unusual. However, this has picked back up uh, as this last week we saw 3,395 patients added for a total of 639,500 patients. And then if we scroll down, basically all the MSOs that operate in Florida here, and if we look for the week of November 12th to the 18th, you can check how many milligrams of THC sold, uh, milligrams of CBD were sold and ounces of smokable flour sold for the MSO that you invest in within Florida. So if you want to look here, um, looks for me though, sales are strong across the board. As long as Trulieve is selling more than a ton of smokable flour, um, I'm quite happy with that. Now on to uh, some other news from other states, Washington DC poised to create new licensed recreational cannabis market. So we do have an update and we are hearing word about this happening, but main thing I just wanted to highlight because uh, still early, the launch could come as soon as August 2022. So still far away, according to MJ Biz Daily Resources, the process will start with a full day city council hearing Friday. Um, that's when local lawmakers will consider a bill from the council president to launch a licensed adult use market, as well as a measure to expand the district's medical cannabis program. So at least we do have some updates out of DC. So I wanted to share that and I will share more as they come along. Uh, this one comes from the French Toast, four states that could legalize recreational cannabis in 2022. Just going to go through them quickly. So we got Florida, population of 21.5 million. According to a recent poll, adult recreational use of cannabis is the support of 64% of voters. And in order for the amendment to reach voters by the 2022 ballot, or to get on the 2022 ballot, they need to collect 891,000 valid signatures before February 2022. While in Ohio, another larger population, roughly 8 to 10 million, I believe, um, in order for cannabis to reach the ballot, the coalition to regulate cannabis like alcohol needs over 130,000 thousand valid signatures to present to the state's legislature at the top of the year. While Maryland uh, doesn't say in here, but from my understanding, uh, lawmakers were going to put it on the 2022 ballot because two thirds of them would welcome the legalization of adult use cannabis. So that would be in 2022 as well. While Pennsylvania, um, no set uh, expectations here. However, there are multiple cannabis legalization bills that could become law currently. And I've covered this in recent stories that both sides, Republicans and Dems are working on this for Pennsylvania. And that's another state with a population of 12 million. So these are more total address markets that could come online for adult use and that would be great for this industry. So a few more things out of states uh, from marijuana moment. Uh, top South Dakota lawmakers officially recommend cannabis legalization bill for 2022 session. And so leading South Dakota lawmakers are officially recommending legislators take up a bill to legalize cannabis during the 2022 session. This comes as activists are pursuing a separate reform initiative for the 2022 ballot and the state Supreme Court continues to review the constitutionality of a 2020 voter approved legalization measure, which again, there's no reason for the Supreme Court to be thinking over this. The voters voted for cannabis and it was one politician that decided to say, no, no, I, I know better than all the voters of South Dakota, which is still just insane to me. I'll bring that up every time I relay that story, but good news for uh, voters there. While bipartisan Wisconsin lawmakers unveil cannabis decriminalization bill, uh, bipartisan Wisconsin lawmakers on Tuesday unveiled a bill to decriminalize cannabis possession, a notable development in a state where cannabis reform has consistently stalled in GOP-controlled legislature despite support from the Democratic governor. Sure, decriminalize it so you can't put people in jail, but allow organized crime to run, run the uh, industry. It makes no sense to me, 
but seems like a little bit of progress out of Wisconsin. Now we're just going to backtrack to Canada as we did get our retail sales um, for the latest month, September 2021, and all of Canada for adult use sales sold 354 million, uh, which just beat August of 353 million. So it's good to see that these sales numbers are still going up. Again, led by our most populated province, Ontario, of 141 million, um, up from 139 million last quarter. Then we have Alberta uh, with the second most Quebec sales decreasing because they won't open stores, and then British Columbia. Uh, bringing in relatively the same amount. So at least in Canada, sales are heading up despite the mess of an industry uh, that they can, or despite the mess of an industry that the bad management had created, I would say. Because I just wanted to share this uh, from MJ Biz Daily. Canadian cannabis industry uh, employment tumbles as producers drew federal COVID-19 cash analysis shows. And again, this just highlights sort of the, the negatives of the corporate world where sure, yeah, bad management forces companies to aim too large. So they hire on a lot of people and they obviously can't fulfill what they were aiming for, so they just have to fire people. Sadly, it's just, you know, the company telling the people a story, the people believing it, and then that not actually being the case. So it's just, it's very unfortunate that the Canadian industry has become a bit of a mess. And just to highlight, four companies accounted for almost three quarters of its job losses, Canopy Growth, Aurora Cannabis, Sundial, and then I would say Tilray before it merged with Afria. So this at least makes me feel good because I was never a Tilray owner, I was a Afria owner, so at least I could say that in my due diligence, I picked the right company in Canada, so I can be happy about that, but I, I am willing to admit that the rest of Canada, it's still a pretty big mess, and you know, unfortunately, it did not leave a very nice stain, and so that's where the U.S. has been able to watch Canada and be able to learn from our mistakes and you know, manage properly um, and, and run their businesses efficiently. However, again, just these are uh, the main culprits in Canada of, of spending too much money, then taking government money from the pandemic, and then firing all of these employees as well. So it's really sad, but if we look at the breakdown, Tilray pre-merger fired 616 people, Sundial 670, Canopy Growth 1,175, Aurora 1,357. So it's just unfortunate. Um, but, it, you know, they, these were promises that were made that couldn't fulfill because the promises were just a little too good to be true. But that's it for Canada. And if we jump back over to Europe based on the, the Germany announcement, I'm not going to get too deep into this because I still think we're a long ways away from any actual progress or thing like action happening and implementation. But Europe is months away from recreational cannabis domino effect, says Cure Leaf Cheap. So just bringing in this all ulterior or alternative uh, viewpoint, recreational cannabis gaining traction. So it marks the latest in a growing number of U.S. cannabis companies eyeing investment in the European cannabis market. During last week's cannabis Europe 2021, Prohibition Partners co-founder and CEO Stephen Murphy said that the progress being made in this region is representative of growing interest of U.S. companies in Europe who are now investing and participating in the industries. And as of right now, it seems that the companies with the largest foothold there are Cureleaf and uh, Tilray because of what Afria had there previous to the merger as well. So however, unlike many of its peers who opt to focus on the safer bed of medical cannabis growth in Europe, Cureleaf is setting itself up for what it sees as an inevitable legalization of cannabis for recreational use. And so this is the last thing I'll highlight. We think that we're on the verge of seeing the next big inflection point, which is to some countries legalizing the access to recreational cannabis. We think that it is going to happen in the course of 2022 to early 2023. Now, I think it's too early to say anything, but this is a prediction from Boris, who's obviously on the ground there and planning, you know, d a decade ahead with his business. So it is an interesting take and one I thought worth sharing. But that is it for today's episode, folks. I want to thank you so much for tuning in and I really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think of the stories mentioned today? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, concerns, or suggestions and I'd be happy to address them. Besides that though, if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like on it. Subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos and I'll be back on Wednesday for a midweek update. Have a great weekend, everybody.